I'm going to be talking about um, some of my dissertation work and also some more general information about ancient Egypt in regards to the smells um, and the scents that they were interested in at the time. I just want to start out with some quick acknowledgments as usual. Of course, thank you Saskia Mineta for uh, inviting me to give another lecture. I will be referring to uh, the other ones that I've given through the Institute. Of course, it's not necessary that you will have seen them before, but it's just to give context for um, for those of you who are returning uh, attendees. I'd also like to thank Amr Shahat at UCLA, who's a friend and, or a colleague of mine and a friend, of course, at UCLA, um, who's helped connect me with people in the field and really facilitated my research, as well as the people at Beni Swaif uh, in Egypt, which is a site that I visited and I'll be talking about today. Uh, in addition to that, of course, my advisors from UCLA, as well as everyone at the Department of Medicinal and Aromatic Plants that I met um, over the course of my research. So I am a fifth year now PhD candidate at UCLA in the Coates and Institute of Archaeology. Um, I'm hoping to finish up my dissertation this year, probably next year to be realistic. Uh, and I've had the privilege to excavate um, in lots of different places uh, from Egypt and Ethiopia to Israel and Cyprus and also here in the US. Um, though my dissertation work doesn't necessarily require that I excavate because I work mostly with text and image, I do really enjoy dirt archaeology and it um, is a big part of my uh, identity. For today, what we're going to be focusing on, if the cat stops chewing on my arm, is uh, the materiality of scent. Um, but what we're end up going to end up talking about really is that the materiality of scent was less important perhaps than the actual experience of it. And this is an interesting problem that I have to wrangle with in my research because I'm an archeologist, right? So I study material remains and we're interested in identifying material remains and working with materials um, dug up out of the ground. Uh, but trying to understand the experiential and sensory past requires us to use those materials in kind of a different way. So what we're going to do is going, we're going to look at the difficulties with identifying particular uh, scientifically identifiable materials from the ancient Egyptian record and then go through kind of what we can do despite that difficulty. So to do this we're going to be uh, taking kind of a who, what, where, when, why, how approach so to speak and we're going to move through these different categories of smell. So we'll start with a little discussion of language, then art, then the archeology span and materials, and then the people themselves. Hopefully we'll have time at the end for me to rush through a couple case studies. Uh, if at any point you all get bored and don't wanna hear about the topic I'm talking about, I can always skip to the next section. So just let me know and speak up when you have questions. I'm happy to, to answer them as they arise. So the language of smell. Uh, so you probably came to this lecture not thinking that you were going to get a whirlwind tour of the ancient Egyptian language, but it's interesting and I think it's relevant to this discussion. So we're going to do just a little bit of background on the Egyptian language. The Egyptian language actually has four different phases to it. It's old, middle, late, and demotic, and then Coptic. That's five stages, my apologies. Um, and all of those stages, most of those stages can be written in four different scripts. And what you see on the screen now are the four different scripts. So hieroglyphic is actually a script. It's the way that a language was written. And it can be written in old, middle, or Egyptian. Um, so hieroglyphic is the images that you're probably familiar with, the small pictograms, or they're not necessarily pictograms, but they look like pictograms. Then hieratic and demotic are cursive forms of that. And then Coptic is written with the Greek language, or the uh, Greek letters, sorry. Egyptian is an Afro-Asiatic language, which is similar to Hebrew and um, North African languages like Berber. And it lasted for a very, very, very long time, through from 3000 BCE, kind of the beginning of Egyptian pharaonic history, through the 11th century in the form of Coptic, which was still being used by the Christian church there in Egypt. Um, again, we were talking about the phases. Those are the different languages that were around at this period. And there's about 500 signs in the whole repertoire. These are just some images for you. In the top left corner, corner is papyrus with hieroglyphs written on it. In the bottom left and top right corners, written on stone uh, pieces, is hieratic. And then in the bottom right corner is a close in or zoom in shot of the Rosetta Stone, if you're familiar with that, of Demotic. 
the later phase of Egyptian language. And finally, Egyptian language can be read from left to right, from right to left, or from top to bottom, not bottom to top. Um, and it's just to impress your friends, to show them that you know how to read hieroglyphs, you read into the signs. So that means you see how there's a little bird here. You want to read into the sign. So let's look at the horizontal ones. You can see my pointer. Here we go. Here's a little bird, right? You read into the signs, which means this side of the glyphs would be read from right to left versus the other side where the birds are facing the opposite direction and they would be read left to right. Everyone with me so far? Okay. So things to note about textual sources from ancient Egypt. First and foremost, we have tons and tons and tons of pieces of written material from ancient Egypt that span all 3000 years of its pharaonic history um, and beyond. Now, the thing is, is that most of these texts are written by elites and royal people and elites working for royal people, right? And what I like to tell my students is imagine if, you know, in the future, the only thing that is preserved from our time period is Trump's, President Trump's Twitter feed, right? How much information about our current world, regardless of political stance, would be preserved for their understanding in the future, right? It's limited, right? Because it's a biased source. Anybody's Twitter feed is a biased source. So, oh, thanks, River. We're not there yet. So, just similarly with Egyptian, similarly with Egyptian, I'm going to keep talking while I try to fix this. Similar to Egyptian, the sources that we have from ancient Egypt are also biased in the way that they are written from a particular class of people. And typically this class of people is largely concerned with um, propaganda, with maintaining their status as the elite, as the leaders, as the people in charge. And that's something to really remember when you're reading any kind of text of the content, the genre and the author. Um, in addition to this, the Egyptians, and this is going to be relevant for our art discussion, is that the ancient Egyptians are um, described as having this concept called horror vacui, which means a fear of empty spaces. So as you can see, for example, on the temple behind me, there's really no empty space. And the entire facade of this temple is covered with glyphs and images that are working together to communicate a solid message. Now, that message, again, we're talking is, is typically a propaganda message designed to communicate a particular agenda by the people who are designing it. Um, finally, the, the last thing I want you to think about as we go through the rest of this, these sources for today is that the Egyptian language is divided up to, into ideograms, phonograms, symbolic images, and determinatives. And determinatives is really what we're going to focus on as most relevant for this discussion. Um, so I'm not going to go into the definitions of the other pieces. If you want me to, we can talk about it later. Determinatives, though, are silent pieces added to the end of the word that are meant to communicate meaning, right? They have no phonetic value. They just are images of things that tell us what they're trying to say. So if we look at this word on the top, this word spells mesit. And you see this little bird at the end of the, the word, right? That bird is a determinative. It has no phonetic or sound quality to it. It is just telling us that this word before it has something to do with a bird. Similarly, on this word below, which is called mesu, right? Very similar word. It has an image of a child. This is the, the the image that they use for children in hieroglyphs, as well as two people behind it. And this is telling us it's a plural word about people, specifically children. And that's how determinatives work. So if we look at this familiar word that you guys, maybe you have a tattoo of it, maybe you know somebody that has one, maybe you're just familiar with it, the onk symbol, right? This word right here at the top, you can see my pointer, right? When I move it on the screen. Awesome. So the onk symbol here at the top is the word for life, right? Pretty simple. But if we see the onk word with a sandal after it, it, does, it no longer means life, but sandals. Similarly, down here, we see a plant determinative. Onk written with a plant determinative is bouquet. And then onk written with two ears, these are cow ears, kind of stylized at the bottom, means ears. 
So that's why determinants are so important with the Egyptian language and why Egyptologists really, really love them because they really help us understand the nuances of their language and their cognitive structures and everything that goes along with it. Now, we're here to talk about scent, right? And yet we've been talking about language this whole time. So let's see how it translates into what we're interested in. So on the screen, we have two more words that are written with a little jar determinative. You can see the same one here, as well as the one below. When you see me look off to the side, I'm looking at my other screen, just so you're not like, where's she looking? Um, in addition, this first word has a tree as a part of the determinative. So this word says bach, so bach oil. And the second one is merhet oil. And so both of these words have the same determinative, which is typically understood to mean some type of scented oil. So great, really interesting determinative. Unfortunately, this jar determinative is also used for any kind of liquid product. So it can only tell us so much. Fortunately, we know that Bach and Merhead are very popular oil types from other contexts, and so we can understand it in this way. And yet, the problem is, if somebody up to the street came up to you and was like, hey, I want to buy some Bach oil, you'd be like, what, what, what kind of oil, right? Like, what is that? We as Egyptologists or archeologists really have the same problem. How are you supposed to identify Bach oil by an English term or any kind of modern language term that we can understand the materials that went into making it, right? Um, it's just like if you go into a perfume store today and you order, you buy the Egyptian perfume. I mean, each Egyptian perfume that you're gonna buy is gonna have a different recipe for it, but it's all gonna be called the Egyptian perfume. And the ancient Egyptians kind of functioned the same way which makes it so difficult for us to reconstruct these words and recipes and identify these materials just from the words that we have on a page, or in this case, the potsherd. But it doesn't stop there. <laughs> it gets even more complicated. So this word, sinecher, is a really, really common word for anybody who likes smell in ancient Egypt. And you're going to hear me refer to it again. So it's pronounced sinecher, um, written within the transliteration just below the word here. And all four of these words on the screen, so one, two, and same three, four, are all um, the word sinecher. But you notice all the determinatives are different. So we can look at the one in the top left. This word is understood as a verb, meaning to sense or to purify, sense it with a C, right? Like using incense. The one on the top right is sensing, so the act of sensing. It's a noun. And the bottom left is just the word for incense, which has a book roll as a determinative, meaning some type of abstract thing. And the bottom right is to cause to make divine. Right, so all kind of similar, but actually quite different things. And they're all written in similar ways, but not quite the same way. And I'm not gonna bore you with the specifics. But it causes a lot of difficulty when we're trying to identify a material like this, because some people believe that sinecher is frankincense. Some people believe that sinecher is pistachia resin. Some people think that sinecher is just a general category for incense. And so whenever you get it across the 3000 years of Egyptian history that we're looking at, who knows what it's talking about really, right? So again, identifying materials from language is really, really difficult. Uh, one more, the last controversy that we have when it comes to identifying materials in terms of language is, is the problem of scientific analysis of jars. So sometimes we're lucky enough to excavate a pot that's intact and sealed, sometimes, and it might even have a jar label on it that says something like Nehe in Pa, and then it's broken. Nehe is a type of oil, so that's great. It's labeled it's sealed. So let's just pop that baby open and get a GCMS machine and test that material and see what's inside, right? Well, there are lots of issues associated with this as well. Um, least of which is finding a GCMS and knowing how to operate it. And first and foremost, opening sealed vessels is really frowned upon and is very unlikely to happen in any museum institution, number one. Number two, products degrade over time. So trying to scientifically test residue from a 3,000 year old vessel is not going to give us specifics, specific identifications. If we're lucky, we'll find out that it's a resin. If we're really lucky, we'll find out it's a conifer resin. And if we find out it's a conifer resin, then it probably means that it's pistachia resin because that was the most popular one at the time. But that's like the best we can do. 
Um, I want you to remember this word nehe because it's going to come up again. Uh, it's just a word for oil that um, has a rather complicated history. At one point it was identified as sesame oil. Sesame oil being something grown on Mesopotamia, which is you know, quite a far distance from Egypt. We're talking about the modern day Iran. Versus um, sometimes it's identified as olive oil, which was native to modern day Syria, Palestine, much closer to Egypt, definitely in trade relations with Egypt regularly. Um, it's interesting to note that this jar, or this um, potsherd that you see on the screen on which this jar or this label was found, is actually on a piece of pottery that's been imported to Egypt from Canaan, ancient Canaan. So we're talking again, Syria, Palestine. Um, so the fact that it's a, a mark that was written on the pot after it was completed and then shipped to, presumably to Egypt is interesting because it brings up our final issue with residue analysis. And that is, think of these pots as Tupperware, right? How many of you only use one Tupperware for chicken, <laughs> right? You've probably used, if, you're, if you eat meat, right, you probably used all of your Tupperwares for chicken at some point. Um, and that same Tupperware has probably also been used for salad and soup and everything in the middle. Um, and so similarly, the ancient Egyptians, think about how long it would have taken them to make a pot, right? It's a lot of effort that goes into making a ceramic pot. If you've ever been to a pottery place, it's a, little, it's a good amount of time. So it would have been used and reused and used again until it broke, and then it would have been used again as a writing surface. So doing residue analysis on pottery is really difficult because um, these products are reused so much. Okay, so that's in summary of this first section that we've gone through, is that in ancient Egypt, we have lots and lots of texts that tell us so much in-depth information about the social structures and politics and economy of their world. But unfortunately, our English translations of those texts are often unreliable given that our identifications of the materials of the products that we're interested in to talking about today are mis, um, misidentified or too overconfidently identified, I'll say that. In addition, as a way of um, working with this, we can uh, consult the determinatives from the original text to try and get more information about the type of product, perhaps whether it's incense or a, a scented oil or an unguent, all those would have different types of determinatives, but they can only tell us so much and really can't help us identify the scientific names of these materials. And finally, you, even though you can test the contents of labeled jars sometimes when you get permission, uh, we have all of those problems that we just went through with that process. So it's looking kind of bleak, right? But don't worry, there's some hope in the near future. Fortunately, if we look to the very end of pharaonic history into the Ptolemaic period, we do have some really great information that is available to us. So the Ptolemaic period is the time in ancient Egypt when the Greeks were, or the Macedonians and then the Greeks were in charge of the political system of Egypt. So we're talking about 332 BCE when Alexander the Great came into Egypt and took over, just up until 30 CE which is when um, you know, all that stuff with Mark Antony and Cleopatra went down and the Romans came in and took over Egypt. This Ptolemaic period is um, a really interesting period of Egyptian history because it's a time when the um, Egyptian landscape became uh, thoroughly bilingual, okay? And the Greek language is much better understood than the Egyptian, especially in terms of product identification. So, we even have lists of equivalencies of Egyptian words with Greek words that help us identify what the, at that period of time, those certain words were referencing. And usually it's these texts that Egyptologists and archeologists are using to identify materials. So when you see examples or you see reconstructions of recipes, they're coming from this Ptolemaic period. Now that seems pretty great, right? Because we actually have really awesome, very explicit recipes from this period carved into the walls of giant temples, like this one here, Edfu on the image, as well as the one behind me at Dendera and Philae, if you've heard of it, all these great tourist um, stops. Because these temples are very well preserved, but they were re-carved re or built from the ground up by Greeks. And these Greeks came into Egypt wanting to maintain a high status, right? Everybody wants to be in charge. And in order to do that, they first adopted the Egyptian religion and Egyptian customs in order to ingratiate themselves amongst the Egyptians. 
But then they maintained their status, and this is an oversimplification, but they maintained their status by restricting access to the upper classes with things like, oh, if you learn Greek, you can be an elite too, or you can have this job and work for the, the Pharaoh. Or if you um, serve us in the army, then you can have this plot of land and you get a cut of taxes, a cut on your taxes. So they did these things where Egyptians were lower down on the social hierarchy, but the, it, it was possible to move up and down on that ladder relatively easily compared to some other cultural systems. This means that even though they were adopting the Egyptian religion wholeheartedly and building giant temples in the style of the earlier predecessors to legitimize their rule, they aren't necessarily being completely true to the past. Something else I want you to think about is that Julius Caesar, right, a name that many of us are probably familiar with, he was murdered in 44 BCE, okay? He is closer in time to us today than he was to the builders of the great pyramids in the old kingdom of ancient Egypt. So think about how much has changed between Julius Caesar and us. I mean, think about how much has changed in 2020, right? So a lot happens over time, right? Basic information, you're welcome. Um, and so these writers and these builders and these people who are living in the fourth century are closer in time to ancient Egypt perhaps than um, we are today because ancient Egypt was still around in the fourth century, right? But they're still pretty distant from a lot of the earlier periods of ancient Egyptian history. So to use this information as kind of the end all be all of everything that came before doesn't really work, right? It's inherently problematic, but it's all we have and it is good information. So that's why I bring it up today. And I just wanted to show you some examples. So this is uh, on the screen you see is a recipe from Plutarch writing in the, the third century, which he was quoting from Manetho, who was a Greek Egyptian priest living in Egypt. Um, and you see it's a recipe for kiffy, which is a really popular perfume that you might have heard referenced in other talks about Egypt. Um, and something interesting about kiffy is that the word kiffy is the Latinized version of the Greek version of the Egyptian word kapet. Okay, and I feel like this recipe is probably a similar kind of idea, right? The Roman version of the Greek version of the Egyptian version. So it's kind of like a funny game of telephone, but it does probably have some type of validity. So it's important just to kind of think about these recipes with a grain of salt, but also be thankful that we have them in the first place. Um, this is another recipe um, quoted from Manichae's Sacred Luxuries, which is a book that came out in 1999, which is a great book um, for recipes, for these Greek recipes. And this one was carved onto the wall of the Edfu temple. And you can see it's very specific in terms of the amount of resins being used, how long you do each step, how the steps are in order from one step to the other. And so it's really great information that we have available to us. Um, the names of the rooms in which these recipes were written inside the temples are called laboratories and uh, laboratories, but you know, British colonialism, laboratories is how we say it in Egyptology. Um, and there's lists of resins and gums in these laboratories, as well as recipes based on ox fat for unguents, but also more um, vegetable based fats like starchy seeds. And it seems like these recipes were for products that were specifically designed for temple ritual. Some of the authors you might want to consider checking out if you're interested in this stuff is, um, are on the screen. So we have Herodotus starting in the fourth century, the father of history. Um, we have Theophrastus, who was a, a disciple of Aristotle and then took over at the Lyceum, also in the fourth century. Dioscorides is a Greek physician, pharmacologist, and botanist. Pliny the Elder, you might have heard of. He's the guy that died in Pompeii. Um, he was a Roman natural philosopher from the first century. Galen, who is kind of the father of modern medicine, uh, is a Greek physician who studied at Alexandria and um, Athenaeus of Nicratus, which was actually a city in Egypt, but founded by Greeks. And he was a rhetorician and a grammarian. And all of them have these really fascinating texts. Now, 
One caveat, you might notice these are all men from Greece writing about Egypt. Um, and I think it's important to note that this idea of colonialism and the idea of Egyptomania, even to this day, is kind of built off of this history of developing the Western, our, our idea of modern, the modern West off of the backs of these, these, um, these men. And it's important to understand that Egypt was part of Africa and that many of its traditions actually fit better into, um, or more naturally into the, the traditions of that country at the time. And that I'm working really hard to try and incorporate Arab and also African histories into my understanding of the development of perfume at this time, but I'm just kind of starting with all of this work. And so we have to just kind of understand the, the bias nature of the, this history that we're talking about. And I want, just wanted to comment on it directly. So what I would like to do now is actually turn away from these really interesting sources and look back in time to the New Kingdom, because that's really the time that I'm most interested in. Now the New Kingdom, we're talking about 1550 BCE, and it's the time of King Tut, it's the time of Hatshepsut, it's the time of Ramses the Great, it's the time of Karnak Temple, all of these really big major things that you see in across Hollywood and on the media and everything, right? I fell into the same gap. Um, so that's the period we're gonna be looking at. Fortunately, this period is, or one of the reasons I chose this period is because it's very well documented. And to try and understand the sensory past um, of something that happened thousands of years ago, you want it to be well documented. And so that's, that's why we're going to move into that, that direction. So the art of smell. So we're going to be focusing just another caveat on pleasant smells in this conversation today. Um, but there really was a whole spectrum that the Egyptians were talking about. Because most of the context we're going to be covering are religious and sacred because of the nature of the limited data set that we're working with, um, bad smells were intentionally excluded from these contexts. And um, I guess if there's interest in the future, I can try to do a talk on that. But today we're gonna to really focus just on the positive sense. So, what we're doing now is we're just going to look at some of the different images of scent that is represented in art from the New Kingdom. Okay, so first and foremost, we have incense that is represented. Um, here you see is from the um, Temple of Seti I, a, a pharaoh in the later part of the New Kingdom, and you see him throwing little incense pellets into a fiery bowl of incense with a charcoal burning. Um, probably offering it to a god of some sort. He has a little cup that the incense would have sat in that you pick out and then you plop it into the little bowl at the end. Now it's interesting to note that we have physical examples of these kinds of burners. Note this is from the late period, so just after the New Kingdom, but we do have earlier examples. This one was just very um, similar, so I chose it, where you have this little cup at the end which would have had the coal burning in it, as well as the little holder for the incense pellets that would have been plopped into that cup to burn and offer. In addition to these kinds of incense burners, they also used little simple bowls, like this one here. Um, and you can see the little black pellets. This is from Nefertari's tomb, the wife of Ramses II. And what I want you to note here, and it's gonna come up again later, is that the flames on these incense bowls, just like before, are pointing away from the person doing the offering and towards the person or people receiving the offering. In this case, the four sons of Horus and probably Osiris seated behind them. Okay. In addition to incense, we see tons and tons of flowers and bouquets. Um, these bouquets take the form of things like the bouquet of Amun, which is offered to the deceased in order to provide breath, but also scent to him to help him, because it's usually a male, uh, live on in the afterlife, as well as floral decoration just on the lentils, the above doorways and such, as well as hanging around um, jars and things like that. This is a scene of the opening of the mouth ritual. So you'll notice not only are these these lovely bouquets that have the red poppies in them, as well as the lotus flowers and the, the palm fronds and papyrus stalks. Over here we have um, what are probably persea fruits. Typically there's corn flowers mixed in there, but not in this image, as well as the unguent cones that are gonna come up later. Um, but lots of scent going on this ritual scene. The opening of the mouth ritual was designed to open the eyes, ears, and 
mouth noticeably, not the nose for some reason, I am still grappling with that, um, of the deceased so that he can be revived in the afterlife um, and brought back to receive offerings to continue living. Um, this is more flowers. Notice up here we have the flowers hanging off jars. I'm of the opinion that when you, this design is actually meant to communicate that the contents of those jars are scented. So this is a really important theme. So the idea that an invisible experience is being represented visibly in art, right? So scent, you can't see it. So how would you draw it? The only way you can draw it is through, through implying that it's there. And that's what I believe these lotus blossoms are doing. And what we see is that the, that idea is interestingly translated into the physical world, into a tangible world, where we have jars like these ones depicted here from the tomb of Ka at the um, Egyptian Museum in Turin, Italy. And they're actually decorated with floral designs. Now, painted pottery is not common to the ancient Egyptians um, beyond the early dynastic period, which is interesting in and of itself because most ancient cultures from this time period do have painted pottery. It's a big part of their cultures. So the Egyptians just weren't into it until the New Kingdom when they start decorating them with flowers. Hmm. It's interesting, right? So something to keep in mind, this, this translation of an artistic tool to create a visible representation of an invisible experience into the tangible world. Okay, pretty cool stuff. Um, we also have, in addition to art and artifacts, we have actual flowers buried in tombs, um, such as this miniature bouquet around the neck of a small but beautiful wooden statue of Ka again. And lastly, for flowers, we get broad collars. Again, an interesting um, comparison where we have these floral collars. This is, of course, dry, brown and dried out because it's thousands of years old. Um, but we have them written, designed both in, the, in an organic way as well as in a manufactured way. These are beads meant to represent flowers. So this on the left is, the, is one of the floral collars of Tutankhamun from his embalming cache. Three of them were excavated and it's constructed using faience beads. Faience is like a type of kind of like glass plastic stuff. We don't need to get into it. It's not scented, but it's blue. As well as um, olive leaves, persea leaves, corn flowers, blue lotus petals, picris flowers, nightshade berries, and all of those leaves were sewn into a backing of papyrus and then tied with linen around the neck. And you might have noticed, and we'll see on the next slide, that um, these types of collars were drawn onto the necks of many figures. As you can see here, see the, the floral collars around the people's necks. The next thing that we see in Egyptian art with regards to scented products are, is unguent. Now, unguent is an interesting topic. Um, because it's it somehow made it into the popular media. So if you've you've heard about the unguent cone discussion, hopefully we'll have time at the end to get into that. But there are these little lumps on the tops of people's heads from the New Kingdom through the Ptolemaic period. And these um, are thought to be unguent, meaning fat or some type of animal fat or vegetable fat, fat mixed with scented material, probably some type of resin. Um, these unguent cones that people wear on their heads, like you see in the bottom left here, are very similar in form to these lumps of unguent that we see all over other contexts. So this is like a giant head cone, but it's, it's just a pile of unguent. And we know this is unguent for a fact because we've seen it labeled and we find it in other contexts that indicate that that's what it is. So it's, the head cones are identified as unguent through a similarity in form. So this is rarely mentioned in um, Egyptological literature. Um, so unguent also comes in the form of residue, which I didn't know where to put this, so I put it under unguent. But we have these sealed jars, remember we saw some of these before, which likely contain either scented oils or unguent, 
which come both sealed in jars and hidden from us forever or in these um, chunks from broken pieces. We also get resin um, that's been poured over um, objects from ancient Egypt. So all this black stuff that's on top of the, the King Tut's gold coffin, like why would you want to besmirch it with this black liquid that just covers it all up? Well, that's, that's a discussion for another time. Um, but it's interesting. And then these are all of his unguent jars from King, King Tutankhamun's excavation, or uh, sorry, tomb. It's, it's fun fact, these unguent jars are one of the only products from King Tutankhamun's tomb that were ransacked when the tomb was entered in antiquity. So whether that is indicative of these products perhaps being used in some type of ritual or that they were the product that was um, chosen to be stolen because of its high value is you know left up to us to discuss further. Also a note that the colorized photos of King Tutankhamun's excavation are really fascinating and they're available for free online. All you have to do is Google colorized photos King Tut um, from the Griffith Institute. Uh, and the last product I believe that we're going to talk about is scented oils. Scented oils are a little more difficult to identify in the record, but are in the artistic record, but it, they are there in the form of these um, typically people identify this yellow staining on the linen outfits of the individuals depicted as uh, anointing oil, such as they've been like they're drenched with it. Again, I would suggest that this is a visible um, manifestation of the fact that these people are scented and moisturized with scented material and not that they actually walked around with stained clothing. Um, in addition, this other image on the right is a close-up shot of a coffin and you can see this glooping right here. It's a technical term, glooping, make sure you write that down, um, of varnish which was made with scented resins um, and is something else that I'm interested in from this time. Again, the material form of this found in tombs are these uh, cosmetic kits that we get, as well as those jars that we saw before, um, which are basically makeup kits, right? This might look like something you had your own makeup basket at your home with um, razors and combs and eye paint uh, applicators and everything in between. But all of these little jars probably had little perfumes in them. And lastly, the, as part of the scented oils, we have the seven sacred oils, which you might've heard of before. These are pretty um, hard to track down and we don't really know what went into each of these different recipes uh, other than from the later evidence. But we do have them referenced in Egyptian context since the beginning of Pharaonic history, right? 3000 BCE, we already have this, the seven sacred oils having been established. So they're referenced in the pyramid texts. Um, and on this scene, if you look at the Oh, I, I, I animated it, there you go. Those, uh, that's a visual representation of the seven sacred oils. Note again, the lotus blossom sitting above them. These oils were thought to be used in the opening of the mouth ritual. Remember that one we just talked about? So helping to open different parts of the body and to carry out particularly mysterious ritual aspects of various mysterious rituals that took place. Um, but in terms of the specifics, it's not really agreed upon. So again, we have something like the Hecanu oil, like what's in the Hecanu oil? I'm, who knows? The Greeks knew, but I thought they knew. Okay, so that's our list of product types that we're seeing. Let's see what time it is. Okay, we're good. Um, so now I wanna think about what can we do with this? So, so far we've identified that it's hard to know exactly what materials are being used. But there are products being used in imagery that are implying scent, sometimes more explicitly than other times. There are certain products we can identify, like I did with the bouquets, where it was obvious that there was lotus and palm fronds and lo um, lotus again, lots of lotus, and um, cornflowers and persea fruits, these kinds of things. But that's not always possible. And so I wanna show you just real quickly how it is that I use some of these images as a way of understanding the Egyptian context. So first off, just to kind of demonstrate the difference between an implied scent and the, an explicit scent or direct action, we can compare these two Middle Kingdom examples. Now the Middle Kingdom came before the New Kingdom, right? It's a little bit older, but I thought it was a nice way of ex uh, illustrating this. And it also shows their cute little doggies under their chairs and I'm partial to dogs. So I thought I would share them with you. So on the left, you have a man 
who is holding a stylized lotus to his nose, right? I would classify this as an explicit reference to scent, right? I mean, maybe he's just looking at its beauty and absorbing its beautiful colors. Of course, the paint isn't preserved at this point, um, but it's, it's the scent, right? Versus the image next to it, which has a man sitting and he has, hopefully this form is familiar to you by now, but it may look like the, those jars that had the seven sacred oils in them from two slides ago. So he's not holding it to his nose like we see sometimes, but it's just kind of floating there off in the ether before his face. So I would classify this as an implied scent, right? That it's kind of indicating that the air is scented versus the fact that the guy on the left is actually smelling something. And why does this matter? Okay, we'll get to that. Um, first of all, I want to show how scent is being used artistically. So Egyptian art, we're looking at this scene. Hopefully it's clear on your screen. Who would you think is at the center of this image? Who's the most important figure? Does anybody want to shout it out? It's okay. I've been talking a lot. It's hard to jump back in when I've been talking for this long. Um, so the central figure, ironically, is not the central figure. It's the figure on the left, the mama form. And the way that we can identify this, other than the fact that in Egyptian art, the figure on the left is always the center of the figure, which is, you know, weird to say because English is weird, but is this the focus of the image, is that all of the scented products are pointing toward him. Right? So he has an unguent cone on his head here. The incense burner right here, the flames on the fire are pointing towards him. The bouquet here on top of the offering list is pointed towards him. The, this isn't scented, but I mean, it might have been. The, there's a liquid libation being offered towards him. The lady's facing towards him. Right, So there's lots and lots of hints that he is the center and figure of this scene. But it's interesting that this, um, that the scent right? These visible representations of this invisible experience are pointing towards something, right? It's a little strange, but it's an interesting thing to consider this, how they're using scent as a framing device for organizing art. So just again, this invisible figure, this invisible thing is being used in a visual medium to highlight central figures. So to me, that means it's really important, right? It's serving a really important function, which I got into in our other lectures um, that I've given through here. And we're not focusing too much on use right now and function, but I just want to talk about how the materiality of scent is being used as a, as physically to organize scenes. Okay. In addition to that, we have something called senta, which is kind of an interesting develop, uh, uh, Egyptological like mind thing to think about because senta is typically an inscribed description of the posture of these figures that you see laying down here. It literally means to smell the earth, or sometimes you see it translated as to kiss the earth. And it means that you're basically prostrating yourself in front of somebody that's important. Maybe you're apologizing. Maybe it's a god, right? You, so you senta important people. But Egyptologists use senta in context in which it's not labeled. So it's become a cultural meme of Egyptologists to describe Egyptian context. I think that's, that's fun. Regardless, scent, it's not just smelling the earth, though, that's being emphasized here, right? It's the fact that these people are putting their noses to the ground, right? It's more than scent. It's about distance, and it's also about social expectations and obligations. <coughs> so again, it's an organizational factor for this time not just imagery, but for social behavior beyond art, because we have context that reference this action outside of the tombs. So scent as, again, just as a reminder, we're talking about scent as implied action versus direct action and the significance of that. Um, finally, we also see this manifested in inscriptions um, and other kinds of texts in which the, the text of a tomb scene typically is meant to 
um, it typically goes along with the image, right? Like we were talking about the horror vacui, the fear of open space. You can see on this image of, from the tomb of Pahri, there is no open space. It is completely filled with either offerings or text or this guy holding his two incense burners um, or some like graffiti from 1823, which is nice. Um, and so this horror vacui, we have this text that fills in the space, so it would make sense for it to go along with the action that's happening. Sometimes it actually goes against it, but we're not going to talk about that today. Um, and in this inscription here before this guy, it says that he's going to give all good and pure things to all of these really important gods and goddesses, that they might give the scent of the sweet breeze of the north wind to him. Right, that basically means give him life, give him breath. Right? This is one of the, the purposes of scent in these scenes is to provide life through breath. Um, and so this idea that the scent isn't really, isn't explicitly stated in the imagery beyond the fact that there is incense here with little fire things sticking up pointing towards the offerings as well as the, the seven sacred oils you saw mentioned before. Everyone still with me? Great. So in summary of this section, the context of these images of scent um, are varied across, across the New Kingdom, right? There are ritual scenes, there are offering scenes, all kinds of stuff. We see incense, we see flowers, we see unguent, we see scented oils. But all of these materials are never referenced by their specific materials, right? There are no recipes. There are hardly any production scenes. It's just kind of this generic reference to the act of scenting of something. And my suggestion is that there are two solutions to this. Either it is one, that the people viewing these scenes would have had a cultural fluency with materials and would have known which products were being um, portrayed that we just don't have. Or that it isn't the material of these products that is what's being valued in these scenes. And I'm of course more in the, the latter group thinking that, in fact, you could have, as long as the main ingredients were the same, right? Some type of myrrh or pistachio resin, whatever, the recipes were less important than the fact that you had this nice, sweet smelling scent um, that could be that used in particular context to carry out your agenda. Um, and it's for this reason, too, that I think by the time we get to the Ptolemaic period and the Greek period, that the recipes that they're using or that they're writing down, like Plutarch and Pliny the Elder and all these guys, um, the reason why we have 10 different recipes for kiffy is because the Egyptians didn't have one recipe for kiffy, right, that, that perfume we were just talking about. It's because the perfume, the, the, as long as the ingredients are kind of the same, it didn't really matter, as long as you had quote, kiffy perfume to carry out the necessary um, plan, agenda. And this example on the screen is from a lintel, which is a door lintel, so like the top of a door, or side of the door in this case, um, that was excavated from a gateway at the Karnak Temple um, because the room had been dismantled. But originally, it marked this room of incense. So probably for storage of incense. And it was meant to make pellets daily with the desire that the estate is in the smell of God's land. May she create life forever. So the idea that this room where they store incense pellets was designed so that the temple itself could smell like the land from whence the God came. So it wasn't really important what kind of incense as long as it was incense. So I think that's a good breaking moment moment if people want to you know take a pee or get a water or something or a glass of wine it is six o'clock now so um and i also want to just take a minute for questions and then we'll hop back into it in like five ten minutes or so five minutes Does that sound okay Manetta? sounds great and um if you guys have questions please unmute yourself uh we'll both be here uh unless we have to uh step out briefly but uh i'll be here it's uh, free time now <laughs> um, it's a little different when we're in person, right? Because people can go out and have a cigarette or, you know, get some water. But uh, I guess we'll just hop back into it now. Um, there's no questions yet. Stunned everyone to silence with the, <laughs> all my amazing content. 
Okay. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is production of materials. Where or sorry, before we talk about production, the next thing we're gonna talk about is where are the materials coming from? Where are they collecting these raw materials? Are they local, are they foreign? Is it some mixture? What's going on? So first and foremost, I wanna bring this up, um, is that the ancient Egyptians were interested and in perhaps even obsessed or like really, really, really interested in scent since the beginning of Pharaonic history. So this example is from the first century uh, sorry, the first dynasty, so we're talking about 3000 BCE, just at the beginning of this um, unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. And this is the tomb of Mer Sek Ha Sememses. So it's not super important for you to know that, but it's something interesting. And this, this is a quote from the excavator of this tomb, Petrie, Sir Pe uh, Flanders Petrie. And he writes that um, the space leading up to the tomb, the ramp down to the tomb, was filled up to three feet with sand that had been saturated with scented ointment. In fact, the scent was so strong when cutting away the sand, it could be smelled over the whole tomb. So, and so this is 5,000 years ago, right? So a really, really long time, and the scent was still preserved in the sand that had been dumped over this tomb upon uh, burial. So what kind of material this was, we don't know. He didn't take any samples of the sand to be tested, but it is really interesting that massive amounts of, uh, uh, massive amounts of this product was used. And so you have to think about who was making this stuff? How were they supporting this industry and what kind of materials were they using? Well, if we jump forward 1500 years into the future, we have a little bit of an idea of at least what kinds of products they were valuing at this time. This is like my favorite text from Egypt. I should say like, it is my favorite text from Egypt. I think it's just really personable and really interesting. Um, and has some fun linguistic stuff going on. But regardless, it's a poem. And it was written on a piece of pottery that was uh, found at the city of Deir el Medina, which we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. But it's basically the city of the work people, the workmen of the Valley of the Kings. So all of those Pharaoh's tombs in the south of Egypt and near Thebes, this is the village of the people who built and decorated those tombs. And at that village, we find lots and lots of texts that have been written on little potsherds that are letters between friends that are plays on words that are cute little images, satires, every love poetry, everything that you can think of that a group of people would um, want to have, you know, just people. And in this text, it reads, uh, it is your city that I love more than bread and beer, Amun, more than clothes and oil. Now, Amun is the patron god of, Karn of Thebes, so we know that that's the city that this guy loves more than, you know, food and sustenance. I love the oil of your town more than the best ointment of another land. Now, this tells us a lot. First and foremost, that uh, Foreign oils, foreign scented products were val highly valued, typically more so than local ones. Second of all, the word for oil, where it says I love the oil, is not actually a word for oil. It's actually just the image of a little goat or a little cow. I can show you, it's this one right here. See this little cow laying down? And it even has a little land determinative. This is a canal, super stylized. But the word eu, as it's written here, doesn't mean oil, it means like livestock or cows. So he's basically saying, I love the stench of your city more than the best anointing oil of a foreign land. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty nice image, but it tells us that there's this value of um, foreign products over local ones, typically. But this guy's unusual because he loves the city so much. That valuing of foreign products is not limited to this guy on, riding on his pot shirt in the middle of a uh, Dero Medina, right? But it was actually something that was embodied by people at the top of the food chain, the people in power. Now, Hatshepsut is an 18th dynasty pharaoh. She, um, and she create, she undertook this massive expedition to Punt down here in the south, probably more likely even farther south down towards Eritrea. Um, which is this mystical land, the God's land that we saw referenced in that, ref that um, lintel from Hatshepsut also um, at Karnak from a couple slides ago. And she undertook this massive expedition all the way from Thebes up here, all the way down to Punt along the Red Sea, and just to get incense, right? Incense for the Karnak temple, for the, um, 
for the reasons that that lintel probably said to make the Karnak smell like the God's land. Um, and so you can just see, look at all these boats and all these people and all this undertaking that went into this expedition down south to collect these trees to bring back for incense. And you see lumps of incense up here as well, trees, uh, incense, lots and lots of boats, all lo laden with these products from Poot. Here's a colorized image from the Getty of this scene of carrying the, 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 um, the trees back. So it's interesting because it seems that even though we kind of know which types of products they were bringing back, it was probably myrrh. That seems to be like kind of the number one product for this area. That it's not necessarily specifically myrrh that they're valuing, but the fact that these, this scented resin is coming from the God's land, that it's a distant geographic region that only the people at the top of the hierarchy have the ability to organize their resources for and to go um, collect and bring back. So it's interesting, right? If you're restricting access to a product and you're the only supplier, that's gonna keep you in power longer than it would be if everybody had access to it. Right. So we're just starting to see here now the fact, the way that scent and the experience, the desire for certain experiences of scent actually contributes to the organization at the highest level of ancient Egyptian society. We see this in other contexts too. This is just a handwritten copy of a, a Egyptian te papyrus text. Um, used for translating, but it was the best image I could get. And in this text, it's a um, command to make preparations for Pharaoh's arrival. So think of, I don't know, those movies, there's shows like Downton Abbey when the prince comes to visit or the crown and stuff and everybody's scrambling around to get all the products together to make sure that the, the royalty that's coming to visit is you know, taken care of. Um, this is that kind of text. And in it is a list of oils that are specifically identified by name and by geographic origin, which I was really excited about finding. It's pretty cool. Um, but we see places like Cyprus mentioned, Alasia. We see Hatti, which is from uh, Hittites. We have Sangar uh, the, from um, Babylonia and the Assyrians. We have the Amaru mentioned here, the Mitanni and Kadesh to the south. So that's just what all of these different places mean. So like a full spectrum geographic origins of these oils. And so it's not, and these words that are being used to describe these oils are found in other contexts that are not identified by their geographic origin. So this is another reason why I think that it's less the specific identity or recipes for these scented oils and more so where they're coming from as a representation of power. Um, a, a final comment on this text. Everyone remembers that Nehe oil we mentioned at the beginning of the lecture about sesame oil versus olive oil. Well, in this text, which dates to about the same period as that, that jar label, uh, nehe oil is actually being used as just a general category for all oils. So just to reiterate that, I, that difficulty in translations that we face um, when talking about these products, because here it's talking about all, bring all of these oils and as many oils of the port in order to anoint the army and chariotry. chariotry. So just all the oils of foreign lands, bring all of them. We need all of them. The Pharaoh likes his scented oils. So. Um, just a quick digression, something that I found recently that I thought was pretty interesting. Pliny the Elder actually talks about this idea of uh, scented oils being a way of um, organizing or uh, achieving political agendas. And he describes scent as something that is really designed to be more for the other person than for the person wearing it, right? If you're wearing perfume, you kind of forget about it. You don't necessarily notice it. And that's the other people around you are the ones that are going to take pleasure in the scent. And what he says is we even have people put scent on the soles of their feet, um, which how could that even be noticed or give any pleasure on that part of the body, right? He's not talking about aromatherapy or anything like that. He's just like, why would you put scented oil on your feet? Nobody's going to smell it. Um, and then at the end of this passage, he goes, yet what is most surprising is that this indulgence has found its way even into the camp. At all events, the eagles and the standards, meaning the soldiers, dusty as they are, meaning they haven't had a battle for a while, and bristling with sharp points, are anointed on holidays. 
No doubt the fact is that our eagles were bribed by this reward to conquer the world. We look to their patronage to sanction our vices so as to have this legitimation for using hair oil under a helmet. So it's, it's a really interesting quote because it's talking about the fact that they gave scented oils as a reward to soldiers for good service. And it was in this way that the Romans were able to take over the world. And it's interesting because the Egyptians did the same thing. So nothing changes, everything stays the same. Um, so that's our discussion of foreign oils plus a short digression. But we have to think that local production was also a thing too. But the people that are probably taking advantage of local production are people lower down on the, on the social hierarchy ladder, right? Because going out and picking up a lotus is a lot easier than sending a giant ship, you know, hundreds of miles to the south to go collect resin from a foreign land. Um, and the people that are using the local products probably aren't writing about it because they probably aren't literate or it doesn't seem like something you need to write about. And so we do have evidence of gardens being a really big thing um, among the ancient Egyptians. Uh, both in tomb scenes, we have this, this uh, image, this drawing of a, a tomb scene that's no longer preserved, as well as this model of a garden. And so we know there was interest in local production. We know there were, were olive oil um, estates in the north. Um, but beyond those kinds of abstract references, we really don't have any information on production of this type or the, the grow, growing and collection of um, scented materials in Egypt. Now, in terms of production, and I'm sorry for the graininess of this image, but it's like impossible to find this artifact online. Um, I'll have to go to the Louvre to see it. But it's, it's a, one, of the only, um, one of the only images we have of the production of scented oil. And it dates to the 26th dynasty. So we're talking about the 5th, 6th century BCE. So way after the New Kingdom, 1,000 years after the New Kingdom. And in this image, we see the harvesting of white lilies. Note, they're not blue lilies, white lilies, which were introduced into Egypt in the Persian period. Um, and they grow tall like this, as we see in this image. Then the transport of these lilies to these, these two women that are pressing them in a bag and dipping the liquid into a jar. And then that jar is being sieved into another jar. And then those jars are being offered to this guy who's sitting down with a lotus to his face. So really interesting scene. Um, and we have one other image of this type of scene, which is a smaller fragment. And it's much clearer here, just of the, the bag pressing scene. And we might note here that these white lilies are being pressed, that are being pressed, are labeled as session and which is the same word used to describe blue water lilies. So again, this issue of translation. <laughs> um, the Egyptians weren't categorizing their products in the same way that we do today, which makes it so difficult. Additionally, the only other production scene that I've been able to find thus far actually does date to the New Kingdom, which is great. We saw a zoom in of this scene from before. And we see it's the production of unguent through heating. So it's a different production method. We have a little oven over here down here with the bowl sitting on it, which is very similar in shape to our unguent jar over here. And he's stirring it, and then he's adding some scented products to it, probably coming out of these baskets that are just floating above their heads. Then they're mashing it together, and then I don't know what this tool is. If any of you have made any unguent and know what this is, I would love for your input. Uh, but he has some type of, I don't know, shaper, I guess, making this beautiful little lump of unguent there's some sieving going on, and then we get the jar, the finished jars with the lotus above them, indicating their scent. So really quite explicit, but very strange that this is the only scene that we have of this. Um, so two production methods. So we see, we see the pressing, and now we see heating maceration. Uh, we might note that this scene is part of a larger scene, which is a production scene for a banquet. Um, you see, this is the scene we were just looking at here. And just above it, we see a party going on. We have musicians, we have the deceased sitting before an offering table, and we see everybody getting all dressed up and anointed and um, having a good grand old time, right? So this is a, a sm an example then of a small scale ideal production situation for a, a, an elite person, not a royal person, 
which suggests that production was not limited just to temples like we've seen so far. But that's really all we know. Now, because production was so difficult to track in the Egyptian record, I went to Egypt and visited the town of Beni Suef, which is known for its geranium harvest. Um, I just happened to be in Egypt when this was going on, and my friend Amr, who I mentioned um, earlier in the acknowledgments, uh, suggested and set this whole trip up for me. Um, geranium is very popular in the U.S., right? It's what all those hanging baskets are that everybody has, um, at least on the East Coast, I guess. I'm from the East Coast. In the West Coast, we don't see it so much. Um, but these little geranium flowers, they're harvested before the flower blooms, and they use a process of distillation. Now, distillation wasn't used until the Roman period, and even then it wasn't used in perfume until, like, whenever perfume became, what, I can't remember the date, 1600s at, in Grasse in France with the beginning of the perfume. That was really the beginning of um, distillation with perfume, as far as I know. You all might know more than me. It's kind of outside my wheelhouse. So I wasn't going to Egypt in order to understand how they made perfume, right? I'm not trying to do an equivalency a study of how people still living in Egypt make perfume today versus how they did in the past. Instead, this kind of ethnographic or ethno-archaeological investigation is meant to help me think about the concerns that people who are involved in this industry might have. And I actually learned a lot more than I thought I was going to because um, it just opened my mind to think of new questions that I hadn't thought of before. So for example, and this is the only slide we're really going to talk about for this, the fact that this kind of production, even if it wasn't distillation, if it was pressing or if it was heating and maceration, um, would leave no archaeological record, right? All of this would just decay. And the only way to get um, any kind of evidence of this archaeologically would be through micro botanical analyses. And while those are sometimes done in Egypt and are doing being done more so, especially by my friend Amr, um, who I mentioned, uh, it's not super prevalent. And a lot of the sites that have been excavated to date did not collect dirt samples, so we'll never know. Um, in this scene, we see the image of the processed geranium, we see the harvest, and we also see the growing plants all in the same area. Other things that I learned about when I was here was the, um, the lack of involvement of the political system in the manufacturing of this product and the effects that had on the, the, um, the people doing, carrying out the work, uh, these, which is really interesting and helped me start thinking more about the political involvement in the ancient production of um, scented products. And finally, something that really struck me was the fact that the, the man who owns this distillery, well, a couple of the distilleries that we visited, he's a high school principal. And he, did, he, started, he built this distillery by himself as a hobby for additional income and because he was interested in it. And that really points to the seasonality of this kind of work um, that I hadn't really thought of before that um, was likely something that the Egyptians had to grapple with as well. The next thing that we can think about in terms of production um, that Egyptologists like to reference all the time are titles of um, work, work people. And because every, the Egyptians were super into listing their titles, like, oh, I ha have these 50 million different things that I do, and I'm going to list all of those titles on my tomb just to make sure everybody knows how awesome I am. Uh, and so I was like, maybe they have some titles about oil production. And while I found quite a few, which you can see on the list here from the New Kingdom specifically, None of them are really about production other than the incense roaster and the oil boiler, right? Most of the other things have to do with controlling spaces or actually applying these products. And it's also important to note that most titles that are interesting and that they crop up all the time. And these have two or three references total from the corpus. So something interesting to think about. Why is it not, if these products were so highly valued and so highly sought, why are people not trying to advertise their role as um, productive people helping produce these materials? I don't know the answer to that. Okay, so summary of the archeology span section. Um, production is absent from the record, largely. Um, but this is not true outside of Egypt, right? We have olive oil presses all over the Mediterranean world. We have 
palaces in the Mycenaean world devoted to the production of scented oils, right? It's just in Egypt that this is kind of hidden from us. Um, additionally, it's possible that this is actually not hidden and it's just the way that we've been going about our studies and that it's actually subsumed under other titles and industries. For example, wine presses might also have been used to press other kinds of products like olives. Um, we also talked about how the production is tied to the state economies and politics through trade and access to resources, right? We talked about Hatshepsut's expedition to Punt uh, and the, the poem about valuing foreign products over local products, as well as this idea of all of this contributing to the maintenance of the status quo, i.e. the keeping the powerful people in power through restricting access. So now we're finally going to talk about the people. A little bit. So um, again, we're not really talking about the function of scent across these different contexts, even though that's really where my dissertation work focuses mostly. Um, but in order to talk about the people and how and why they use it, we have to kind of um, do a quick summary of that kind of stuff. Uh, so here's my list. <laughs> The uses of scent in the ancient Egyptian world involve these different areas, and I'm sure it's not even just limited to this, but these are the kind of the areas that I've been focusing on in terms of good, pleasant scents. So we have the use of scent in ritual and in the transition of the deceased into the afterlife, which is what a lot of those tomb scenes are devoted to. We also see the use of um, resins especially, but scented oils and unguents as well in mummification, likely contributing to the preservation of the body. We see scent featuring highly in acts of display. So think um, I am driving a Ferrari so you know that I'm wealthy kind of display, right? I smell like incense of, of the Hittites, which is modern day Turkey, right? So I'm pretty fancy, um, as well as gifting. So giving people um, scented products as a way of celebrating particular moments in, in our lives and times, especially at, like ch after childbirth, you get lots of scented oils. We also see scented products being used um, sensually. So we have love poetry that often invokes smell, as well as um, some artifact categories that typically relate scent with, um, scent with sex. So um, things like unguent spoons. So we see this is an example of a spoon here on the right, but it's, it's not one of the sensual ones. Um, sometimes they're in the form of nude females, uh, which is where this possibly colonial, possibly, yeah, uh, inappropriate interpretation comes from just because the woman's nude doesn't mean it's sexual, right? This is the, the history of Egyptology we're grappling with still. In addition, we use a scent, scented products for hygiene, right? They wash their clothes with it, they wash their bodies with it, they moisturize hair and skin using it, same way we do today, as well as medicine, um, using scent as ways of identifying if you're pregnant or if you have a blockage somewhere in your body, these kinds of things they use scent for, um, both as cures and as ways of identifying um, illness. So, what I want to do now, as promised, is we're going to do a really miniature short case study on the scents of Deir al Medina. So, again, Deir al Medina is the city of the workmen of the Valley of the Kings and Valley of the Queens that was made up of the families of the workmen as well. So, the workmen would go over to the Valley of the Kings, walk over there, and hang out for about 10 days, and then they'd come home and have a week off with their families. So the women and children were mostly left at home to kind of take care of things there and then the men went off to paint and carve and um, design the tombs for the pharaohs. Now this is one of the best preserved towns that we have from Egypt. We don't have very many towns from there to talk about um, and it's often used as a way of talking about the daily life of the Egyptians but it's important to remember that these people were completely supported by the government. Right? They were hired workers, they were isolated from other, the other cities, um, and they were kind of separated and um, they had to have all of their water and food brought in, right, because their, their, their city was located in the middle of the desert near where the tombs were being built, instead of along the Nile like all the other cities. Um, and all of their pay was directly from the government um, in that way. So it's, it's a unique area, but it also has so much information for us to play with. So 
when the, the data from this site actually takes the form of these things called ostraca. And ostraca is just a fancy word for a potsherd that has writing on it, okay? So we, from these potsherds, we have letters between friends, we have lists of goods probably associated with bartering or with preparation for festivals. We have um, rosters uh, from work, so like who missed work on what day and for what reason. And we have other types of references to litigation, right? P oh, this guy stole my donkey and I want reparations kind of thing, right? Really great text and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And actually many of them are available online. I should have put this site up. If you're interested in like perusing these things, <laughs> um, it's, you can just Google Dear El Medina online. I can show you how to spell that again too. So the things that actually reference scent include mostly gifting or requests for gifts of scented products from people outside the city. We also see feast lists, so that means, that's really hard to say, <laughs> feast lists um, of products that needed to be gotten together or were gotten together for feasts. We have requests for work, like I need so much um, sinecture in order to varnish my coffin for my dead mother kind of thing. Um, duty rosters we talked about, those duty rosters typically when they're referencing oils have to do with uh, lamp oil, which may or may not have been scented. They were using uh, oil lamps for light. And also in the context of litigation, so people stealing scented oils from temples uh, and these kinds of things. Okay, let me, I need to move my cat, sorry. Again, oh, that's my face, thank you, River. Okay, so what we can conclude from these texts, and they're really kind of piecemeal and hard to understand, that's why I didn't give any examples today. Um, but what we can understand from all of these primary sources is that there are references to some of the oils that we know for a fact were considered high quality because of the, qual the adjectives used to describe them um, and because the same kinds of products are found in temples. And for me, this is really important because it's the idea that this elite sphere, this temple high elite religious political system of uh, finding and using these really important foreign goods was not completely divorced from you know the more regular person right that there it wasn't it's not that like it's more of this idea that i see a ferrari driving around and i know i can't afford one but i know what it means to be able to afford one and i think that's kind of the idea that's going on with these products and it's important to think about because the political system the culture of the ancient Egyptians was designed in a way that, or ended up organically developing into this idea that the people lower down on the, the social ladder wanted these products, even though they couldn't access them. So think about how we treat each release of the new iPhone, right? Have you ever seen those lines outside the Apple stores when there's a new iPhone? They're insane. I'm, a, I'm an Android user, so I can't necessarily relate to this, but there are a lot of Apple users out there and a lot of people always wanna have the newest product. And I feel like with scented oils, it's kind of functioning in the same way for the ancient Egyptians, that everybody wanted the, the stuff that they couldn't have. It's very human if you think about it in that way. So this idea that, um, yeah. So that's the first conclusion from this study. The second is that the those the social values that we and this is more for um i'm sorry for the people who have, we've see, talked about the value of scent in religion already in terms of the transition of the deceased into the afterlife these values these high level religious elite values that are associated with scent in these kinds of restricted spheres like temples and tombs get translated into more mundane contexts through the through its social value right why why is it that a scented oil has a, a inherent value to it? There's not really a good reason, right? It's just something that they wanted. It's something that the system was designed to make them want. We don't need the newest iPhone. My last iPhone worked just as well, right? Yeah, it has a nicer camera, or maybe now it has like 10 cameras instead of five, right? But there's not really a reason that you have to have the new one. It's because you want it. And I think you, 
the oils are kind of functioning in the same way and this social uh, as a social value it's a it's a display thing i have access to this and it looks like the people at dero medina could access these kinds of more restricted products when the circumstance called for it and more likely than not they had more access than most people because of their connection to uh, royal power and because of their work right they needed to have these oils in order to varnish the temples or to build the coffins of the king so just to kind of a wrap up of all this craziness um, linking the ideas of this language of scent the art and archaeology of smell as well as the questions of who's using them and why is that there's this existence of a generalized but perhaps still significant cultural value of scent that was prevalent among the ancient Egyptians of the New Kingdom. And that it was less dependent on the particular material pieces of these perfumes and recipes and such than it was the actual experience of scent itself. The visual representation of the invisible experience seems to be at the core of this. And that's really what the next two case studies that I want to run through are going to um, be emphasizing. In the first, we're going to talk about the unguent cone and how just like we saw the lotus becoming or the, the flowers over the jars becoming translated into a physical realm, a tangible thing, we're going to see the unguent cone doing the same thing. And then the second case study is going to be about the lotus. Uh, or more accurately, the blue water lily and why um, the misconceptions associated with that and kind of how it becomes less a product unto itself, this idea of, oh, I want a blue lotus because it has a lot of inherent value and more just a simple icon of scent. And I'll, I'll give you a modern example to illustrate that more clearly. Um, before we go into those case studies, I just have some lists of um, sources and materials that in case you're interested in following up on any of this uh, beyond um, you can always visit my website I, I think I only have one web article out right now but a couple more in the the works but there these other articles are really helpful especially if you're interested in specifically like the recipes from the Greek period um, and then we also have a list of websites which are really interesting and free um, that I like to share. OsirisNet.net has great write-ups of all of the tombs of ancient Egypt, as well as awesome images, which you probably saw I featured in a lot of my slides. Um, and then the Giza and Amarna projects are really great for information about those two websites, or those two <laughs> excavation sites. And then the Perseus is a translations of a lot of those Greek texts and those authors that we we're talking about at the beginning of the, the talk. So unguent cones. So unguent cones are interesting because they made it into popular media, right? The news picked up on the fact that we've actually excavated two examples of an unguent cone and it's revolutionized the field of Egyptology. Um, and so there's all these news articles. I got um, emails from the New York Times and from a German science magazine asking for interviews about this product, right? Me at the PhD candidate, I was like, what is going on? Um, but it became a big thing for a little while. And so I just, and I, I've gotten a, quite a few questions about it um, in some of the talks that I've, I've given. So I just wanted to do a quick overview of kind of my perspective on what's going on with the Unguent Cone. And remember, this is just, this is new research. This isn't published. This is just something that I've been thinking about um, and working with. So if you do use any of this information or reference it, please do um, cite me because it's, it's all just stuff that I've been thinking about. So the unguent cone are these lumps of fat that sit on the tops of the heads of individuals in tombs and like coffins, mostly stela also, which are just rock cut images of deceased figures with text on them. Um, so mostly funerary contexts. And the theories, we talked already about where the form came, how we identified it as an unguent because it's very similar to the, the mounds of unguent that we see in those jars everywhere. And so the theories starting in the 70s or so, people started debating about whether or not these unguent cones were real. Did the ancient Egyptians wear fat cones on their heads or did they, are they just symbolic? And people, there's lots of articles about this, debating it back and forth. 
Some people believe that it was just symbolic um, or iconographic rather than being an actual physical object. Other people believed they were actual um, lumps of fat that people wore on their head that would have melted in the heat to moisturize the hair and skin. Um, that theory in particular is based on comparative African evidence from ethnographic work done in the 70s. Other people believe that it was symbolic, but still an actual object that people wore. Uh, a more recent theory is that it was, oh, I should say symbolic, meaning it's, it's some type of representation of rebirth or regeneration, which is what Egyptologists like to say when they don't know what's going on. Um, a recent publication by Padgham argued that the unguent cone was actually indicative of the ba of the deceased. The ba is the aspect of the soul that um, after you die kind of preserves your person, like your personality. It's usually the person headed bird that you see. It's the only part of the soul that can actually move in and out of the tomb. Um, it's the parts of the soul are really hard to describe, but so there's th that was that one argument. And then um, some people say that it's everything, right? It's a little bit of all of these things. My own suggestion is that these unguent cones are just like I've been reiterating over and over and over again is the visible manifestation of the invisible presence. Right, that they're representing the fact that these people are wearing unguent as a moisturizer, as a way of invoking the gods, as a way of being scented and as a way of social display, all of these uses that we just talked about. Um, but as a, as, so it's an iconographic image, but it's also physical in the fact that it's representing something that they're wearing, right, just in a, in kind of a stylized way. This gets complicated, though, with the fact that we've excavated um, examples of these now, and I'll get into that in just a minute. So what do we know for a fact about these unknown cones? Well, we know for a fact that the form changes through time. It doesn't appear until around the New Kingdom but it continues in use through the Ptolemaic period. And we find it across lots of different contexts, but mostly having to do with death and the afterlife. The color and the shape and the decoration of these cones change through time. So you can see, if you remember that banquet scene from Rec Marais with the short little miniature unguent cone we saw a while back, and now we see this one here, which is really tall and skinny and has the little yellow cap on top. That's the, there's kind of a linear development of the shape of these cones through time. And finally, the context in which we find these unguent cones are very greatly. They can be ritual scenes, they are banquet scenes, worships of divinities. Uh, we have them depicted in hunting and fishing scenes, playing music, uh, especially anything having to do with childbirth. And there's even one image of a market seller with a woman se selling cheese and she's wearing an unguent cone. Okay, so lots of different weird examples. What does this tell us? Not a lot, but um, we did excavate an example. So the, on the next slide, there is an image of a skeleton um, just to, uh, as a, a body warning for everyone. Uh, so the archaeology uh, of the unguent cone. So Adam Marna, which is the city of Akhenaten, he's the heretic king you might have heard reference. He came about in the end of the 18th dynasty when, um, and this is usually over exaggerated, but he wiped out all the other gods and made everybody worship the sun, the Aten disk. Uh, and he built a new city from scratch out in the middle of the desert called Amarna, well along the Nile, but in Middle Egypt where there was no other city. And so it was at this site, this unusual site that only dates to a period of, I think it's not just a few decades, right? Um, they excavated two cones from non-elite graves. They excavated over 700 tombs or burials from this since, I don't remember, 2005 or something. So they found two of them though. And not all these tombs are intact, so there might've been more, but this is what they have. So it's important to remember these are non-elite graves, which is interesting, and that it's a unique context um, because it's a Marna. Using uh, drifts, which is a type of spectroscopy, they were able to identify that these cones were made from a biological wax. And the only wax that the ancient Egyptians used was beeswax. So uh, they also tested the hair around the cones and found that there was no wax on the, ha on the hair itself, so that the cones in fact did not melt as some theories have suggested. 
The first cone is described as having a silky feel, but both are described as being hollow with thin walls um, and likely filled or at least uh, lined with linen on the inside. So what can we make from this? Well, there was no evidence that they melted, but it's possible that these cones might have just been models and not actually used. Um, we don't really know. The fact that they excavated these examples neither proves nor disproves really any of the theories that we just went through. Rather, I suggest that this is um, an example of experimentation because this, the sample size is so small. And it's a really interesting example of translating a visual symbol into the tangible or physical realm in the same way that we saw the flowers functioning from art into the jars. Um, like in, you can see in these examples, just as a reminder. Uh, it was desirable to be marked with an unguent cone in deceased context, likely because of the connection between scent and the successful transition of the deceased into the afterlife, something that we didn't talk about today, but just something that I'm just going to tell you was a thing. Um, and that this physical model in burials is likely functioning in the same way, in that it's creating an atmosphere of scent through visual consumption, right? Maybe scent dissipates over the years, um, but in this way, because they have this physical visual representation of scent, even if it doesn't smell anymore, it's still communicating this idea of scent. Um, so kind of like a safeguard. Remember these non-elite people aren't ba being buried in tombs with lots of tomb scenes and burial goods. It's just them in a hole. Right, and so using these unguent cones could be a way of um, fixing that problem. So again, what we conclude from this is that it's not necessarily the types of material being used, but the experience of scent and actually the form that these products are taken. Um, and at the top of the screen is a quote from the Book of the Dead that I used to talk about this idea that you wanna smell like the gods in order to be successful in your transition to being one of them um, as an effective dead person. And it, uh, interestingly, it's the same quote that I heard a Catholic priest say at a funeral I went to about 10 years ago, um, which got me all started into all of this nonsense. So it's funny how things don't change. Um, further reading for the unguent cone, if you're interested. Um, yeah. I don't have a lot to say. The, the last one is the publication of the, the most recent publication of the unguent cones that came out by Anna Stevens. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would recommend that one. I think it's available open source online, but I'm not quite sure. You can always email me though. So we're going to run through the Blue Lotus real quick. We've kind of already covered it, but um, just because it's interesting and then I'll stop in time for some questions. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions around the Blue Lotus. Everyone knows the image of the Blue Lotus from ancient Egypt because it's ubiquitous. It's literally everywhere, even in modern Egypt, uh, as a symbol of Egypt, right? It no longer grows in Egypt, which is interesting that it ma it's maintained as a symbol. So the blue water lily, the one that we see in all of the art, is actually the Nymphaea chirulia. I'm sorry if I'm butchering that Latin, but I know I'm, Latin is not my first language, um, which was native to Egypt just as the white water lily was, the Nymphaea lotus, um, but the white lotus for some reason wasn't really popular, like the blue one. I think it might not have as strong of a scent I've read. I've never actually um, been able to get my hands on any. And all of this is further complicated with the idea of the Indian lotus, the Nalimbo nucifera, which is the pink one on the screen and wasn't introduced into Egypt until the Persian period during the late period, or the, during the Persian wars, of the late period in Egypt, so after the New Kingdom. Um, this is all further complicated with the, the equivalencies and terminology for the Lotus Eaters from the Odyssey. If any of you have read the Odyssey, the Lotus Eaters are the people that Odysseus and his crew visit. And when you eat a Lotus, you kind of like lose your mind and your will to go home. And Odysseus is like, no, don't eat the Lotus. And all of his crew members eat it and then nobody wants to go home and it's a big deal. So the Lotus is seen as a narcotic. Um, this gets mapped on to the lotus of ancient Egypt, which is mi mistakenly identified as a lotus. It's actually the blue water lily, um, suggesting that the blue water lily was a narcotic as well because of this confusion. Something interesting to think about. Now, 
this is going to get kind of confusing, but that's the point, right? This whole talk is about confusing you. I apologize <laughs> if it's breaking your brain, but hopefully it's been entertaining for you. Um, the Greeks, when they're writing about the blue water lily, make things even more complicated, okay? Herodotus writes, when the river, meaning the Nile, is in flood and overflows the plains, many lilies, so using the word crinea, which the Egyptians call lotus, lutone, grow in the water. So the Greeks are trying to distinguish certain flowers from other flowers with their terminology, and they're suggesting that, Herodotus here is suggesting that the Egyptians didn't do that, they just called them all the lotus. Now, something is interesting for the word, the word for the blue lotus is session, which we see, we saw in that one lentil, or that one carving was also being applied to the white water lily by that late period when that, that image was carved. So the word session gets translated into Hebrew as Shushan, which might sound familiar as Susan, in case we have any Susans in the audience. Your name comes from the Egyptian word for the blue water lily, fun fact. And Shushan from Hebrew gets translated into Greek as Suson, which is, equivoc is equivocated with the word krenon, meaning lily. So it just all gets messed up, right? There's lots of terminology and confusion. And I think this French quote is really um, apropos in this context, just in terms of our own um, way of describing these words. So it says lily pour le lit. So the lily is used for le lit. The water lily for the ne nu fa, so another type of flower. And même the lily of the valley for the mouche. So the French have three different words for three different flowers, and we use lily, water lily, and lily of the valley, all for the, and they're all confusing. So we can understand why there's been a confusion with the blue water lily um, in the ancient Egyptian context. Um, but what is the, why is it significant? Well, so the blue water lily, there's this myth that it sinks when the sun goes down and then it comes back up when the sun raises. And this myth was actually started by Pliny the Elder in Natural Histories, which is that huge long quote that you don't have to read that's on the screen. And because of this myth, and because of the fact that the ancient Egyptians did associate by the New Kingdom the lily with um, the sun, that Egyptologists just say, oh, the blue water lily, that's about rebirth, right? Because it goes under the water, it dies, and then it is born again when it rises above the water. So fun fact, the blue water lily does not do that. In fact, when it goes under the water, it dies, but lots of new ones emerge to cover it up. So it's kind of impossible to tell whether it's the same one or not. I think there are some forms of water lilies that do do this, but the blue water lily specifically does not. Whether that's significant or not is, I think it's, it's debatable, but it's just something to think about. But so this, this simplistic idea that you see the blue water lily, it's associated with rebirth because of its relationship with the sun um, is, is problematic. It, it kind of works, but it's not, it's not the whole story. So what I think is that this symbol is so ubiquitous that we see it in so many places that by the New Kingdom, the blue water lily has actually lost its specific symbolic value, whether it's rebirth, whether it's transitioning to the afterlife, whatever it was in the beginning, whether it was just a symbol of pleasant trees and good smells, all of these are different theories by Egyptologists, and that by the New Kingdom, it's actually just become this kind of simple, icon of scent and its many implications. And so kind of in the same way that it remains a symbol of modern Egypt today, even though it no longer grows there, it's kind of lost its more inherent uh, values that's specific to its breed and is now more just kind of a reference to scent in itself. And a way of understanding this that I can offer you is the Starbucks symbol and also the Apple symbol, right? The Starbucks symbol, if anyone knows it's a mermaid or a siren, that doesn't have, we, when we look at that symbol, we don't look at it as a mermaid or a siren or think about the connection between Italy and coffee, right? You look at that and you're like, oh, Starbucks. I could totally go for a Frappuccino right now, <laughs> right? The same thing with Apple. Apple is actually called Apple, so it makes sense that their symbol is an apple. But looking at that symbol, 
it doesn't, it's not invoking an apple for you, right? It's invoking the company and the, the products associated with that company. And I think Lotus is, ends up doing the same thing by the New Kingdom. Just like you can see here in this image of a tomb scene where it's just, it's the decoration on the, out, on the top layer of this tomb. It's just, it's just a marker, it's just a symbol. Um, I would say that it maintains its, its value as scent because we still see people smelling it, but it's not so importantly specifically a blue lotus. Okay, so that is all the content I have for you today. I'm sure it was um, a lot, <laughs> but I hope it was clear. I tried to go through it um, piece by piece. I'm always happy to talk with people about this stuff. I'm in the midst of dissertating, so I'm always thinking about this kind of content. I have an academic website that I try to update. On there is a scent blog. Uh, I like to mention in these talks, if anybody has some particular stories about smell that have affected them in some way or changed the way that they view the world, there's a spot on there that I would love to get your stories from. I don't think I've really gotten any yet and the website's been live for about a year, so we'll see. I'm also available over email and um, on Twitter. So on Twitter, I, I only have like 50 followers, but I'm trying to build up an academic Twitter. So follow me for more scent stories about archeology. span um, but that's it. Uh, so uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and thank you all for coming.